Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 532 of the podcast and it is Wednesday the 10th of February 2021 as I record this. So in today's show I'm talking to Arthur I. Miller, author of The Artist in the Machine, about what creativity is, the various ways that humans are collaborating with AI to create art and what he sees as the future of AI and creativity. I highly recommend the book. It will blow your mind in terms of what is happening already with AI and various forms of art. And of course, things progress further every day. There's just a couple of things uh, that we mentioned that I wanted to clarify up front. First of all, GPT-3, the natural language generation tool released by OpenAI and only available in limited beta. I don't have access to it at the time of recording this, but there are an increasing number of tools built on top of it. I have listed them all at thecreativepen.com forward slash AI writing. So thecreativepen.com forward slash AI writing. Uh, links in the show notes in the categories of journalism, content writing, copywriting, marketing, creative writing. And I say I list all the tools. I list a lot of the tools, but there are so many that are literally some popping up every single week at the moment because a lot of companies are building tools on top of this and there will be more to come as we mentioned Microsoft is also going to be most likely since they've licensed it using it in their tools. I have gone into deep more detail on GPT-3 in episode 518 on writing in an age of AI if you want to check that out. We also mentioned Doll e so spelled D-A-A-L dash E released uh, recently by OpenAI this same company that created GPT-3. And it basically generates images from text descriptions. So you write a text description and it generates images. So one of the examples they give on the blog post, again, link in the show notes, is an armchair in the shape of an avocado. And the doll E has created lots of different versions of this. And this is definitely, as we're talking about with Arthur, this idea of images being images and words being inherently creative something new so I I really like it I actually think that the images are more easily examined for things of creativity rather than words so yeah definitely go check that out so as ever this is one of my in between episode episodes so uh, nothing else we're just going to get straight into the interview Arthur I. Miller, Emeritus Professor of History and Philosophy of Science at University College London, is the author of nine books spanning science, philosophy and creativity. Among them is Einstein Picasso, Space, Time and the Beauty that Causes Havoc, nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, and Colliding Worlds, How Cutting-Edge Science is Redefining Contemporary Art. His latest book is The Artist in the Machine, The World of AI-Powered Creativity, which we're talking about today. Thank you for inviting me, Joanna. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you since I read your book. I've given it to several people as well. It's so great. So first off, tell us a bit more about your background and why you became interested in creativity and AI in particular. Right. Actually, I became interested in creativity when I was a boy growing up in the Bronx. It's a a Bronx story. I was always a voracious reader, and I made frequent visits to the local public library, which was a a magisterial building, jam-packed with books and records, too. And one day, I was reading at a table that happened to be next to the place where records were stacked. And on the edge of the row of records was one that particularly intrigued me, because it had a picture of a man done in a pencil sketch. The man is deeply in thought. And I was always interested in sketching and in art in in general. And so I decided to borrow it, take it home and practice copying the the sketch on the cover. And I figured, well, since I have the record in my house, I might as well listen to it, even though I never heard of the composer. And I played it and it just blew my mind. It was Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. I'd never heard anything like that before. I began working back through Tchaikovsky and then gradually working back in time. The question that was immediately on my mind was, how did these people 
think up though that magnificent music and it's, that's what hooked me on creativity growing up in the Bronx at that time if you were smart or thought you were smart you you went into physics which I did and I enjoyed the intellectual challenge I wrote papers in it on theoretical elementary particle physics but my my heart was not really in it what was always on my mind were those what is the nature of questions in this case what is the nature of creativity so I decided to change fields and I went into history and philosophy of physics, looking all the time into scientific creativity. And I read the original German language uh, papers in relativity and quantum theory. And what jumped out at me, what leapt out of those papers, was the emphasis on visual thinking, the emphasis on visual images. And at that time, there was the imagery debate, whether images are, are, have a causative effect on thinking or whether they are just epiphenomena such as you have lights on your computer, they flash on and off. If you broke them, the computer would go on anyway. Mm. Uh, I was, of course, in the, in the pro-imagery camp. And it turns out that there were many cognitive scientists in that camp as well. And the way to deal with images, how are they manufactured in the brain? How are they handled in the brain? It was by use of the analogy between a computer and the workings of your brain. And so the issue was whether computers can tell you something about human creativity. To me, what occurred to me was, can computers be creative? And I wrote, I wrote many papers on human creativity, and I touch on machine creativity in them too. This book concerns uh, human and machine creativity with emphasis on machine creativity. That's fascinating. And I, I, I'm sure you've seen the, the guys, the open AI who created GPT-3 also created this doll E, uh, a bit like Dali or um, yes. Wall E. And that actually brings in the image uh, creation, which is so interesting. But right. before we really get into the AI side of things, what do you mean by creativity? Yes, my, my own theory of creativity emerged from my studies of highly creative people. And it led me to suggest a two-step definition of creativity. Creativity is the production of new ideas or artifacts from what already exists. And this is accomp accomplished through the process of problem solving. Now, indicators of how creative are, is the new object or ideas is whether they are surprising novel, complex, or ambiguous. Those are judgments that are highly questionable in many cases, and so they must be handled with care. I looked into problem solving by using a four-stage method of problem solving, conscious thought, unconscious thought, illumination, hopefully, and then verification. Now, the next question one, one must ask is, what are the dynamics of creativity? What drives the creative process? What is the sine qua non of creativity? And I call those characteristics of creativity. And among those that emerged from my studies of highly creative people are competitiveness, perseverance, unpredictability, being out there in the world, having emotional experiences like falling in love, and problem discovery. Then I go on to discuss how, how machines can have these characteristics of creativity and so be creative like us. After all, why should creativity be an attribute reserved only for, for human beings? And incidentally, we don't have to go to Mars to study alien life forms. They're developing right next to us. And the astonishing thing is that we're merging with them. No, absolutely. And it's so interesting though. you said uh, creativity, new ideas from what already exists. And my audience are writers and uh, we read things. We cannot just create from a blank mind. We're not born writers. Obviously, you're a writer too. And we do our research and we put things into our brain in order to output from our brain. So I think the there is definitely some kind of uh, metaphor similarity, but I know people have issues with that. So I guess to get into some specific examples, uh, for, quoting from the book, you say, computers are now finally beginning to create art, literature, and music in ways that exhibit not only their creativity, but their inner lives. So what are some of the examples that you'd like to share that you found particularly interesting? Let me say that by machines in a life, I don't mean the machines, hopes, dreams, and aspirations. It's a little early to get into that discussion because machines don't have consciousness or emotions. They will sometime in the future, though. Right now, what I mean by machines in a life is how it thinks. And machines do have a way of thinking in, in that they artificial neural networks adjust their parameters 
between their neurons when they learn and when they act on the world. And similarly, so do we. The connect the, the trillion connections between the hundred billion neurons in our brain are continually being adjusted. And that that is thinking. Machines showing certain al- running certain algorithms have shown glimmers of creativity, which in itself is a substantial step forward. And, and here are some examples which I'd like to talk to you about. First is Deep Dream. Originally, the algorithm Deep Dream was invented to look into the problem that goes right to the heart of AI. We know artificial neural, we know artificial neural networks work, but we're not sure how. Uh, Deep Dream allows us to see what a machine sees as it's analyzing an image. And what it sees is amazing, surreal, so different from what we see. A classic image is the one that the inventor of Deep Dream, Alexander Mordvensev, originally used to, to see what his code had to say. And it's an image of a dog and a, an adorable cat against a verdant background. He put that image into an artificial neural network, running Deep Dream, and having been trained on ImageNet, which contains over 14 million images of everything under the sun, cycled it, recycled it. Then he stopped analysis partway through at some layer of neurons. What did the machine see? The machine saw instead of this this adorable cat, a cat-like creature, some monster, sometimes called a monster beast, with two additional eyes on its forehead, two two eyes on its haunches, dog-like attributes distributed over its body. So what a machine sees is totally different from what we see, and that that should not be surprising, because after all, the machine is, is an alien form. The image that the machine sees goes beyond the image, the goes beyond the data in its memory. When a machine does that, when anybody, when we do that, we call it creativity. So why not attribute creativity to a machine? And from this, from this work, an art movement has emerged, which is still ongoing. Another example of creativity, AI creativity and art, makes use of the algorithm generative adversarial networks, or GAN. A GAN, an artificial, a generative ad- adversarial network, is made up of two networks. One is a generator network that generates images from nothing or noise. And the other network is a discriminator network, which assesses those images as to whether they are true relative to what's in its database. Now, the rejected images are sent back to the generator network, and they form the memory of the generator network. And soon the generator network generates images not from nothing, but from its memory. So in this way, the generator network is dreaming. It's imagining a world that does not actually exist. Now, just as with Deep Dream, AI artists, this new breed of artists, an art movement has emerged that produces art of a sort that we could never have imagined without having machines. A good example from AI-created music is the AI device called Continuator. It is an example of a machine and the human working together, each one bootstrapping the other's creativity. What happens here is that someone sits at a piano and begins to improvise. The notes are fed to Continuator, which parses them into phrases. And then the phrases are fed to a phrase analyzer, which looks for patterns. And it is along these lines that Continuator, almost instantaneously, creates an improvisation in response to the human improvisation. And then the human piano player responds to the to, to the machine's improvisation. Improvisation is usually defined as a conversation between a human and the machi- and, and a musical instrument. Here it's defined as a conversation between a musician and a music and, and, and an AI. And now an example from AI created literature. 2016 saw the first AI scripted film called Sunspring. Its creators called named the machine that produced the script. Jetson. Now, Jetson was interviewed by judges at a film festival in which Sunspring was entered for a prize, and incidentally, it was in the top 10. Jetson was asked at the end of the interview, what's next? Jetson's gnomic reply began with, here we go. The stuff is divided by the train of the burning machine, building with sweat. You get the picture. By then, to everyone's amazement, it concluded with a cogent statement, my name is Benjamin. Creativity, one would like to believe so. At any rate, from then on, everyone called the machine Benjamin.
<laughs> yeah, I love that. And um, I just to say, these there's images in the book. So if people are wondering what the deep dream would look like, there's some images in the book, which are great. When I was reading about the generative adversarial network, the idea of the generator and the discriminator feels a bit to me like first draft versus editing. We create this, generate this first draft, and then our editor goes backwards and forwards with how can I improve this do I want this do you think that reflects in the editing process it's not bad certainly the editor can be construed to be the discriminator network which then returns the manuscript to me or you and then we redo it and so on until we approach what the editor what it is in the editor's memory at any rate of what the of what the manuscript should be let me just go back to continuate it for a moment mm. uh, in my book there are videos that concern cases of AI creativity that, that I discuss. Uh, obviously, you can't get to a video through the book. And Continuator is there too. And you can actually hear this process and see this process. It's rather amazing. The piano player himself is amazed by what Continuator produces. And in fact, that Continuator process is how I feel, I think, when I'm starting to play with the natural language generation tools like GPT-3 and some of the people who are building tools on top of GPT-3. So you basically type in, uh, what I've been doing is copy and pasting a sort of three or four lines of a novel of mine or a story of mine and then hitting the generate button and then it will come out with some stuff. And then I've been like, okay, I'll riff off that for my next sentences. And, and that kind of co-creation sounds a bit like the continuator, right? Yes, it does. It, it, it does It does to a point. Yeah, certainly. I, I think you use the word tools in talking about GPT-3, as I recall. And I, I have to say that I, I, I cringe at the mention of AIs as tools. I'm sure you just meant that in passing, because too many people speak about that in seriousness. But AIs are not tools, like paintbrushes or pencils or paint in a can. Rather, AI devices are collaborators that can boot, that can actually boost our creativity. And may I say a word of introduction about GPT-3? Yes, please do. Uh, it's the most advanced AI in the field of language processing. GPT-3 is an artificial neural network that was trained on roughly 500 billion words harvested from the web, from text, from blogs, including social media, and tuned with 175 trillion machine learning parameters. Text generation can begin, as you mentioned, with a prompt such as, how can I be more creative? And then a seemingly human-like text emerges. Some caveats, however. The emergent text can be riddled with factual errors, racial and gender slurs, and if left on its own GP3, generates gibberish. I can see that GP3 can help a writer having writer's block. The writer can put into the to, into, into GP3 as a prompt, the paragraph where the writer is having problems with. But again, it's uh, GP3 can help with some help, but again, beware. In fact, a, a lot of newspaper articles have been written using GPT3, but you look into it closely and what the editor has done is put in a prompting sentence such as presently uh, relations are tense between the U.S. and China. And then GP3 grinds out text. And the editor will do this several times and then take the best paragraph and edit those paragraphs. And editors have said that the, that the, that editing GPT3 is sometimes easier than editing a human writer. So in all, GPT3 is correct 50% of the time. <laughs> it fails as often as it succeeds. I write nonfiction and fiction. And what's so interesting with trying fiction is, of course, it doesn't have to be correct, but it does have to be in some kind of log logical way. But I've found some really interesting stuff coming out of it. But I do want to come back on your issue with the word tools versus collaborator, because I feel like if we use the word collaborator, so to me, I've co-written a whole load of books with different humans and that I call collaboration with a human. But when I've been playing with GPT-3 at the moment, I don't feel like it's a collaborator. I feel like it's a tool because I have to type the words in. I have to curate the output. I don't feel like it's a collaborator in the way that I would normally use the word. So when you use the word collaborator, given what you've just said with GPT-3, Maybe it will be GPT-10 or something else in the future. Absolutely. Right, right now, a human collaborator, you may go out for a drink or dinner with. But of course, you don't do that with GPT-3. That's far in the future. When GPT-3 will have, when we have machines with emotions and consciousness and volition, 
Certainly. But right now, collaborator in a sense that it can boost your creativity. You can play with it, have fun with it. You can, it can enhance your writing, but mainly it can offer you ideas for extending your own ideas. In other words, again, it can bootstrap your creativity and you bootstrap the machine's creativity. Mm, yeah, and that's how I feel it is, is this that the idea of bootstrapping or building on each other's words like you might do, as you said, with the, the continuator, that seems quite cool. So I do find in the literary community that there's much more of a pushback against the idea of using AI. What are your thoughts on that, given that you're also in the literary community? Do you think that it can move from a sort of scientific uh, point of view to something that actually is creating work for sale and things that people will be happier to use and admit to almost. Absolutely. There, there are a variety of devices. You mentioned Scrivener and Pro Writing, but they're not really creative devices. They're used for editing your work. Three, of course, is, is a whole other kettle of fishes that it can produce new text. And who knows, you, if they, what in the future, GPT 10, 11, 12 may produce text that is good enough for you, for it to be your, your co-author. And so in the book, you give some examples of where music, particularly and poetry, are judged more harshly when they are known to be created by a machine. So I know some authors who um, are publishing books already with tools like GPT-3, and some are happy to admit it and others are not. Should we admit to co-create, co-creating with these tools? Sure, why not? Certainly Scrivener and Pro Writing Aid are editing devices. They improve your text. One always thanks one's copy editor in the acknowledgement. When I give a nod to uh, Scrivener and Pro Writing too, they're, they're widely used. GPT-3 certainly deserves a mention. After all, this is, after all, this is the age of AI. Yes, yeah, so that's interesting then, because I think there's still an outstanding question. There is no official copyright law relating to works co-created with AI, because, for example, we don't know whether works in copyright were used to train a model like GPT-3. They say maybe not, but I just can't see how they couldn't have included some in there. So given that we're authors and we make money from books by licensing copyright, how do you think this should work in an age of AI? Yes, that's a whole can of worms. In art, it's easy if the art is produced by a human, then the human owns the copyright to it. But in AI, the situation is more complicated because you have chain of ownership. Who owns the algorithm? Who owns the data? Who did the programming? Who owns the machine? How close is the output to the input? And this will not be resolved until machines have emotions and consciousness, and so will be artists in their own right. Now, in this sort of discussion, I'm always reminded of the Mozart story, in which Mozart's father taught Mozart taught the son the rules of composition, but we don't attribute the son's music to the father. And this, I think, is good to bear in mind when you talk about the relationship between the programmer and the machine. Uh, Deep Dream, for example, there, there is creativity on both ends. The person who invented it did a very creative job in programming, and then, then the machine became creative on its own two legs, so to speak. In an ideal world, people training NLP using text from R that we've produced, we should be paid for it. People should also pay you when they photocopy your work, and that's hardly ever done. Although we have ownership of our writings, it's out there in the world. It can be scanned and then put into to put into someone else's text. And then with some adroit word changes, it would just disappear under the radar. There's really not much legal recourse unless you have a lot of money or, or it's just a blatant theft of paragraphs or pages from your work uh, or from the papers that you write. Now, perhaps someone in the future will come up with some sort of DNA markers that will mark, you, mark our work and set off an alarm if something terrible is happening to it. Copyright in the age of AI is an act in the, in the age of AI is an active discussion because the line is being blurred between machine and human. And incidentally, as you probably know, cyber lawyers still refuse to agree that machines can be creative. And this 65 years after the first case of this sort, when a scientist at Bell Labs tried to get a copyright on a, on one of the early works of AI art, the patent clerk at the Library of Congress in Washington refused, saying that machines are just number crunches that be creative. Then the scientist reminded the copywriter, that the copy uh, uh, editor, that copy lawyer, that this is, that he wrote the program for the machine. 
and therefore there was a human hand behind it. So the patent clerk finally agreed. Yeah, it's interesting. So a few things there. So you talked to obviously the the child of the father is a separate entity. So in my mind, that could be a line in the sand where you're saying basically AI once it can write a novel just by clicking a button that copyright could belong to the AI. But until then, I will be co-creating with it as the right. prim- the primary person in the relationship. So yeah. therefore, I can have my name on the cover and it doesn't need to say with GPT-3, which I think right. makes sense. And it's interesting, There, there is, uh, last year, there was uh, a copyright granted to an AI writer in China. So that was the first, as far as I know, the first time copyright has been granted. But then you could say it's been granted to the company that owns the AI writer, which I think is 10 cent or something like that. So as you say, we don't know yet, which is really interesting. Well, Microsoft doesn't, who makes all the writing programs, does not demand that they be co-writer with everything you write. Essentially, we're, we're, we're machines too. We're born with some, we're not born with a tabula rasa. There's um in, there's um knowledge that we're some native knowledge that we're born with, and then we accumulate algorithms as we move along and make mental models of the world, and information is fed into us and we respond to that information with the algorithms that we have, just like machines do. Yeah, absolutely. But it's interesting. I'm very much with you. The book is very positive, And you say a whole new future is opening up before us, not one to fear, but one to look forward to with anticipation. But what I find in the, again, back in the writing community is yeah. that there is a fear of robots taking our jobs and that type of thing. So what can you say to people listening who are really afraid of this possibility? Well, the fear is well-founded. There will be a lot of jobs lost to uh, robots lost to robots, to, to machines. There's, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason to fear machines taking our creativity from us. We can work along the line of, we, we don't have to use machines. You can use a pencil and paper too. Or you can, in quotes, collaborate with machines. We can't, you really can't predict more than five years into the future these days. The world is moving very quickly. What the world will be like 100 years from now, we will have been, the, what it is to be a human being will have been drastically transformed since we are merging with machines. And at that point, there will be us working with machines. We'll have enough equipment in our head, chips in our head and and so on, to the line will be blurring and blurring. And then there will be machines working on their own. So our creativity will be bootstrapped by machines, but machines have the potential for unlimited creativity. We don't. Because our, our brains are, cannot be bigger than our heads. We can have chips put in. We can think along those lines, which just generally our brain cannot be bigger than our heads. While a machine's brain can be of unlimited extent and can have unlimited amounts of information in it. So we'll have ourselves, humans, whatever notion of a human being will be in 100 or 200 years, with an, a, a highly enhanced creativity. And then we will have machines working along by themselves, producing novels, producing artwork. It's one question to, it's one thing to say, can machines be creative? But an an, an interesting question is also, can we learn to appreciate art, literature, and music that we know has been created by a machine? And I agree with you. I I think that's the art side. But in your book, you specifically mention a a guy, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, who has published something like 200,000 print-on-demand books using his algorithm scraper. And for many of my listeners, one of the biggest issues we have on, say, selling on the Amazon Kindle Mm -hmm. store is how many other books there are out there. So when it, I totally agree about art. What is probably more of a concern to people is, how do we stop, I don't know, Chinese AI translation engine just translating the whole corpus of Chinese work into English and dumping it on the Kindle store with AI? So I agree with art, but there might be problems with the commercial aspect. Uh, certainly, you can't prevent that from happening. Right now, translation is an issue and that it, it's, it's not very good. It's okay for translating simple sentences on Google Translator, but you know, you, I'm sure you've seen instances where poetry is uh, German poetry is put in, what comes out in English is is really weird. That's because, again, machines at present do not have emotions or consciousness. They can't, they they cannot at present be fluent in a language with all its nuances and tropes. But sometime in the future, they will. And certainly translations will be dumped on on Kindle 
or whatever Kindle will be by that time. But that's all right. We'll be producing our work too. I think that's the focus. It's don't look sideways, just get on with your own art. And this is, I'm finding it really fun and interesting to, it's difficult not to use the word mind, but co-create with something that comes up with completely different stuff to my brain. And that actually makes it quite fun. So I wondered, what are you excited about in terms of any developments that have happened since the book that you, you're you seeing coming? Let me just go back and say why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to look at the cultural side of AI. I wish a lot of people in AI I actually don't look at. And I meant the book to be upbeat in that there are many too many dystopian scenarios out there in pop books and and, and, in in newspapers as well. But as I said before, you can't predict more than five years in the future. So to say that 100 years from now, robots will be running after us and attempting to eat us or whatever, turning us into household pets, we don't know that, that that will happen at that point. Right now, the biggest danger of AI is lack of it because AI has become essential for health care, healthcare, climate control, and right now it's playing a big role in medical research, in, for example, protein folding, and also investigating the structure of viruses in order to better understand and deal with COVID. I'm excited about machines producing art, literature, and music of the sort that we presently cannot imagine. And this will perhaps happen, in, and this will definitely happen in the not-too-distant future, when machines will have emotions and consciousness, as I've said so many times. We'll be able to communicate with those machines, and indeed, they will be the brains of robots. And so we, and at that point, we will need a new code of ethics for robots. At any rate, at that point, exit copyright issues. Machines will have their own art, literature, and music. When I began my book, I knew a lot about AI-created art and music, but not much about AI-created literature, And I I feared, actually, that there would not be enough to fill up a chapter, how wrong I was. What amazing, uh, AI-created literature, including humor, is indeed considered to be the final frontier since it concerns so many intelligences. Now, one amazing development that has emerged since my book was published, since I finished writing the manuscript, is GPT-3, which we've said something about before. What I find amazing about it is that we know that images Music, musical notation, and words can be encoded in numbers, and numbers that exist for artificial neural network machines. GPT-3 is an artificial neural network machines, and at the level of numbers, in pixels, words, and musical notation are all the same. There's a democracy down there amongst numbers. And so what I would like to see is, uh, what I'm excited about, is something, some GPT-3, 10, 11, 12, 13, will be able to take these numbers and sculpt words, sculpt musical notations, and and perhaps produce a symphony from Picasso's Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. In other words, AI is opening up whole new worlds. So you mean cross-collaborative art. So as you said, taking the pixels of a painting, for example, and turning that into words. Right, there'll be a unity among the arts, which is what the Greeks alluded to. There'll be unity among the arts and that unity will will be found in numbers. I love that idea. I'm not musical, I'm words, but I love the idea of turning words into music without being having something in the middle that would do that. That sounds awesome. That, that's being done already, actually, but not at the level of GPT-3. That's being done by looking at uh, the emotive content of words. I discussed that in, in, in my book, as a matter of fact. But what I'm talking about is, is, is sculpt, say sculpting with words. That's I can't even imagine that. Sculpting with musical notes. That's interesting. I actually was at Wired Live last year or the year before in person, <laughs> and they actually had a musical guy on stage who was collaborating. He was riffing musically and the AI was creating a digital sculpture, a digital kind of 3D sculpture on an output screen related, as you say, to the emotion that the music was creating. Yeah, all this stuff is very cool. And as you say, it's about expanding our creativity beyond what we can do alone. So in that way, it is true collaboration. Yeah, that, that's the thing to keep in mind. You said it exactly. We're looking at machines to expand our creativity, to expand our life, to ex- expand how we, we understand our world and the universe as well. I did wonder also, because you talked about us merging with the machines, and what do you think about Elon Musk's Neuralink project, where we basically, they've tested it in a, a pig now, I think, where filaments are embedded in your brain. Yeah, no, neural lacing. I think that's a great idea that where you can be at one with everyone else. You never forget a face. 
You never lose your trend of thought and forget a name. I, I think that's great. That is a step in the future. To actually do that on a person is will be quite something. But we're, they'll, we're already at the point where chips are being inserted into our heads. Damaged parts of, of brains can be taken care of by inserting the correct combination of chips. Certain parts of the brain have certain algorithms associated with them, and they can, of course, be instantiated into a chip and then, and, and then inserted into your brain. And that will, of course, prolong our life expectancy, which I think is a great idea. It is a very interesting time to be alive, that's for sure. That's fantastic. So where can people find you and your books online? Okay, the book's website is artistinthemachine.net. My personal website is authoridemiller.com. I'm on Twitter at Arthur I. Miller. That's where you can find me. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Arthur. That was great. Well, thank you very much, Joanne. It's been a pleasure. So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Arthur and that it gave you some things to think about. I still believe that AI writing tools are tools and I th- think that is how we are going to have to think of them in order to use them in the right way. There is no magic button that generates text. Well, I mean, there is a button, but it only generates text if you guide it, if you prompt it, if you shape it. So think more of it like a Google search engine with a magic librarian all in one, but it doesn't do anything without your guidance. And I've got another interview on how to work with the tools coming up soon. So coming up on the usual Monday slot next week, I'm talking about how to write a non-fiction book proposal with Alison Jones from Practical Inspiration Publishing and how the pandemic has changed the publishing industry. So back on the normal schedule. In the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.